Welcome people who are joining. Lovely to see you here. I hope you're having a fantastic day so far today. We're just uh, waiting some other folks to join. Just doodling in the meantime. For this session, it's going to be a lot more fun. If you uh, have a pen or paper to hand, it doesn't have to be anything fan fancy. A biro will do. Sharpie-esque thing will do. A felt pen will do. Fantastic. Well, it's great to have you all here. There is at least one familiar face. Hi, Judy. Good to see you. Long time. Um, and I recognize some of the other names, although I can't see them. Ah, oh, there's, a, there's a man I know, Mr. JP. Uh, he can tell you about visual storytelling in lifts, but that's another story for another day. So uh, welcome to the session. Uh, my name's Andy, and today we're going to be talking about visual storytelling. And it's really about some of the secret sauce of visual storytelling, kind of the why, how, and when. And so uh, to do that, I'm going to talk at you a little bit uh, for five to 10 minutes. And then we're going to get your hands dirty and do some drawing and I'll tie it off at the back end. So great to see you all here. Um, and I'm going to flip cameras and go back to the overhead. Um, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why. So why, why visual storytelling? Well, there's a couple of reasons why visual storytelling is, I think, quite special uh, and does quite special things. Um, the first of these is really all about memory. So, so um, pictures um, help us remember. So we're really good at remembering pictures. Like way back in the 1950s, there was a guy called Dr. Fix-It, would you believe? And he did a whole lot of research on the brain and pictures and memory. And one of the things he came up with was, or he, he researched, was the fact that when our eyes are open, at least, uh, kind of two thirds of the electrical activity in the brain is kind of deals with processing imagery. And so that means our brain devotes a lot of resources. So we're really wired for visuals in a way that actually helps, really helps remembering. Kind of more recently, uh, like 2018, um, there was some research done by um, Waterloo University in Canada. And um, they were looking specifically at does, well, they were looking specifically at a whole lot of different techniques for remembering. Uh, and what they found was uh, so strikingly that, that visuals and drawing uh, was imp impactful on how we remember, they called the whole study the surprisingly powerful influence of drawing on memory. Uh, and they said that they actually showed in the study that um, basically drawing is more effective than anything else for remembering stuff. Um, they said it was better than any other kind of memory technique, mnemonic technique, semantic elaboration, visualization, writing, whole stack of things. So we remember pictures. And they're kind of wired into us. So the other thing for all, for all of us is story. And this is obviously the other side of visual storytelling. And, you know, obviously we're, we're kind of wired for story. I mean, we've been, we've been telling stories since we lived in caves. And I would say actually there's a handful of things, you know, we've been telling stories, drawing pictures, making music, uh, playing games since we're in, ca in caves. The kind of basic entertainments haven't changed. Um, but there's something kind of magical about story. And again, uh, we remember stories. Um, we find stories very, very compelling. Um, they stick in our minds. Uh, there's a lovely, um, a lovely tale I came across about um, a guy, a research firm called Gary Klein a few years ago. They were asked to create some uh, kind of conference summary materials. And what they did was pretty unusual. They, they, they went and they kind of went into all the presentations by the keynotes. Um, and they took out the story. So they, they, they like cut off the, they cut off the, um, the preamble at the start um, and they just, uh, they cut off the wisdom at the end and they just extracted the stories from those talks and compiled it into a book. And they showed it to some of the, the participants. Participants thought it was fantastic um, because those stories encapsulated the main things that they remembered out of those talks. Um, however, the, the speakers, they, they weren't so pleased because um, 
and in fact they'd taken out all the speaker's wisdom but the point was that the, the people didn't really need that wisdom they could get it themselves from the story so this business of remembering then um is really a lot of what visual storytelling is about. And you might say, well, Andy, remembering, you know, um, so what? You know, remembering is not such a big deal. Well, I, I kind of counter, I kind of counter that. I think remembering really is a big deal. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm such a fan. I'm sure you, a lot of you are such a fan of, of Kanban. By having something physical there, it's kind of unavoidable that there's 352 tickets in test that need attention. You can't get away from it. Um, so if you think about this, why people don't follow through and do things, very often they don't follow through and do things, not because they're not conscientious, not because they're not professional, but because they just forget and other things are front of mind. And having things visual is a really great way, um, and having things visual in your environment is a really great way to have things front of mind. Now, when we draw... What it does, as, as kind of found in the kind of research we were talking about, is it connects a picture to meaning. And it's that connection to meaning which is why we remember it. With a story, it connects us to how we feel about that story or to meaning over time. So that means that visual storytelling is kind of like a super-powered Kanban board, where instead of giving you a snapshot of where you are now, it places you in the story of how you're doing and making meaningful progress. It's showing where you are in a bigger story. And it's making that impossible to ignore because it's visual and it's kind of in your face. Now, that doesn't just make you remember the story, that makes you want to act. And if you're working with teams and organizations and trying to help them change, that's incredibly powerful. So visual storytelling then, why I think it's powerful is because it's all about creating a shared memory. And interestingly, when in the 70s, when people first started experimenting with live illustration and graphic recording, they didn't call it graphic recording or scribing. They called it creating shared memory. Um, so a compelling shared memory then that puts us inside a shared narrative or storyline where it connects us, I think, to our identity and what we want to happen in our story. It makes us see ourselves and what we want to achieve. So if you aren't at the beginning or that you aren't at the end of something, then you're in the middle of a story. So what story are you in? What role are you playing? And where is the story going? Using visuals as a way of drawing together to find those things out is incredibly powerful. But how, how do you do that? Well, I think there's kind of a handful of ways that we can effectively use visual storytelling. So the first and probably the, the simplest and the, the least challenging, if you like, is uh, individual. So it's quite, and you know, it's quite possible for you just to kind of sit down and break out a pen. Now this doesn't, you don't need to be good at drawing. You just, because it's all about this idea of connecting to where we are in the story. Sit down with a pen and ask yourself, well, where did this thing start? Um, where is it going? Where are we now? and drawing out kind of the picture of where we find ourselves in this story. That's a way of you connecting to the story. And of course, what you can do with that is you can share that with others. Um, and that allows them to reflect, well, where are they in the story? So probably the, the kind of simplest place to start is individual. This is completely unthreatening and you don't need to share it with others. I mean, this is just a great way of kind of orienting yourself in, in space time, if you like. The next one then is where you say, well, you know, that's great, but actually let's explore this together. So you get together with the people that you're maybe trying to do something with and you find some kind of space, whether it be a physical space or an online space where you can just, in a quite a free and kind of not being worried about what the thing looks like way, you can draw together and try and connect to the narrative what's actually happened. There's a funny thing that happens here, which is very different to telling, which is when we draw something in front of ourselves like that, when we're able to point to things and say, well, this thing over here and this thing over here and relate them to each other, we connect to them in a different way. And it also allows us to be a little less caught up in things so that we can actually get a better perspective about where we are in the story. It's easier to say hard things like, well, we've not really made any progress in the last six weeks. 
because it's just unavoidably visible on the page. The third way then that you might um, use visual storytelling is through listening. And so that can be either at a single, a single event uh, or that can be over time. And as you listen, you draw very simple pictures that connect to or act as signifiers for what's going on. The who's, the what's, the events that are happening. And in so doing, what you're doing is you're building up that shared memory, that shared narrative of what's happening. Now, you know, there's a lot of kind of concern about, you know, having skill and being able to do sketch noting and graphic recording. And, you know, it's just not like that. I was talking to someone the other day uh, about potentially working with work visible and they said, well, well, you know, to work for you guys, I have to be able to draw. A lot of what we do involves getting other people to draw because when you're drawing yourself is when you're most likely to connect to meaning. And we use this in our change work. So um, draw individually on your own with it with a group or by listening to capture what's going on and make it visible as the story unfolds. Now, another way that you can do that is that you can create some kind of metaphor for a story and pre-draw it. And then as things unfold, you yourself or with others, you can tell the story as to what happens. What's quite nice about this is that you might have an idealized picture. So let me just use something that's quite, I don't know, quite tropey, I suppose. Let's say there's a mountain range for something we're trying to achieve. Then I would beforehand draw that out very lightly in like a gray like this or in a pencil. And then as the thing happens, then we kind of talk about what's going on. So we start off here. Actually, we didn't end up down here. We ended up down here because we took a wrong turning and found a cave with a bear in it. So this is where we ended up next. And then we wound our way back up to the ridge again, only to find that there was a crevasse there. And so as the story goes on, you're able to actually con connect to and build a narrative. This is really powerful because there's no, because this is um, made visible either by sharing together in a digital space or being highly vis visible in the physical space. It's like a back, in the same way that a Kanban board orients you to what's happening right now, it's like having this background awareness of where we are in the story and what we're facing. And that's tremendously powerful. And the last way then is um, where, you know, you might just use a whole series of kind of mini, uh, mini versions of this in the story itself. So templates that we might use very simply just as layouts for how do we capture questions about things that matter. Or, you know, maybe, maybe we've got a, a challenge coming up. We don't know how to cross. Maybe we've got some, some kind of crevasse we need to cross. And we're asking ourselves, well, how do we get over this? By drawing it out and making it part of the story, it allows us to use this kind of visual storytelling, not overall, but as we come across different chapters and parts of the story. Okay, so these are kind of some of the ways that we can actually use it ourselves, together, by capturing it just by listening, by kind of laying out how we think things are gonna happen and then drawing how it actually happens as it goes along, or by using visual storytelling within chapters to make things happen. Okay, so that's quite a lot of me talking. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to let you experience this a little bit yourself, and it's kind of in a fun way. So we're going to put you in a, a breakout for five minutes with three or four other people. And what I want you to do is to have a conversation and try and come up with a character and a situation that you're all going to tell a visual story about. So, you know, for example, you know, that might be, you know, it might be a, a scenario where, you know, you were, you arrived and uh, maybe the moment that you arrived on this gig, uh, everyone else left, you know, so that would then be the, 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 the starting position is that everyone else is, is kind of, is kind of leaving. But think of a real situation, something that you remember where there's a kind of nameable character and a clear starting situation. And just between you try and come up with one character and situation that you're all going to together uh, create a story about. So hopefully so at least some of you have chosen a character and a situation. Now, this is pretty ambitious given the short amount of time that we've got. So, oh, look, it's Jose. I can see uh, yeah, you've started already. You know, this is leading the pack here. This is great. 
So next, individually, we're going to get you to draw four pictures, and then we're going to see if we can join some of those pictures together to um, tell a story. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit rapid fire. First, I'm going to give you the overview of um, every story ever told, which is basically, um, oh, let me flip my camera because, you know, because, you know, looking at me is just no fun. Okay, <laughs> so every story ever told, let me flip this over, basically starts with character, situation, normal. It always starts with a character. So what I would say is even if you're talking about network infrastructure, turn it into a character, draw a box, give it a name, some arms and legs, it will be more interesting. Then basically something happens, yeah? Something happens that causes that character to need to do something, some kind of challenge, problem, puzzle, whatever it might be. And then that person either does something about that, um, you know, in terms of what happens next, or they don't, yeah? Um, and consequently, something changes. Now, it might be that they don't do anything, but actually it has consequences for them, and that's what the change is. Or it might be that there's some problem that they overcome or that they don't overcome. But at the end of the day, what happens at the end is some kind of change from what happened at the start. And we all know if there's no change at all and nothing happens in the story, then it's just a bit of a boring story. And of course, sometimes we get boring stories and that encourages us not to repeat them. This line down the bottom here, if you're wondering, this is just an emotion line, a very typical storyline for a movie is you start a bit above average, you go down and it all goes to hell. And then, you know, you use some kind of magic weapon to get out of it again. If it's a French movie, it might not be like that. It might be that you start very depressed, you keep on very depressed. It gets hopeful that it's gonna be quite good, but actually it ends up being quite depressing. That's, that's maybe an unfair critique of, of French cinema. Okay, right. So you have got, we've got the challenge now in just a few minutes to draw a few pictures. So the first one is, the first one is the character. So I want you to draw some kind of name for your character. So I'm gonna use Jenny. Jenny is a uh, product manager. Now you've got three choices for the character. You can do um, some kind of shape. That's totally fine if you're really ambitious. You can turn the shape into a person. Yeah, you can do a very simple person, which would just be, you know, uh, kind of an upside down U and either just a tick like that, or you can do a circle like that. If you really want to be ambitious, you can add an arm. Yeah, or an animal. Um, and, you know, any animal in the world that you can basically draw with a box uh, with a couple of upside down Vs as legs. Then you just add a tail and some kind of head. And uh, there we have a terrible horse, uh, some kind of animal. You can easily transform that into a dog, a cat, um, a dragon, um, a highland cow, anything like that. So anyway, firstly, we have our person, situation normal. So you might say they're in the HQ, or you might have some words to say that they're saying something. Okay, so you've all drawn a person. Now, the next thing, you're all going to draw what happens. Yeah, so Jenny has, um, Jenny's been offered a job. So we're going to say she's tremendously pleased and I'm going to draw a cup. Okay, so she's um, she's got a new job. So again, just picture a, a one word thing. So this is this is uh, what's happened. You know, it could be, of course, that um, she's also um, losing, like the entire team is being cut, you know, so that could be another thing. One word and some kind of simple picture. It can be a stick man. It can be just a line. Doesn't it just needs to be enough that you can ascribe some meaning to it? Okay. So next, so so Jenny's been offered this job. What happens next? Well, actually, what happens next is Jenny is in this case drowned in politics. She was really excited about this job, um, but she found out that being on the on the C-suite, Paul uh, ticks. Um, she wasn't getting any, any meaningful work done. Or, or maybe on the other side, maybe in the scenario where uh, Jenny, like the whole team was getting cut, maybe she started to imagine, well, what would a different kind of work look like? It just so happens that in this story, in both scenarios, in both arcs of the story, the same thing happened, which was Jenny left excited about doing work that matters.
So I will give you another minute to try and finish. So basically, simple person, simple thing that happened, simple reaction or action, and simple ending. Um, so um, we're going to do, we're going to put the tunes on for one minute. Do feel free to wave at me if you can. Any sense of anything? So what's about to happen in about 30 seconds is that Manto is going to choose one of the breakout rooms and spotlight the people who were in that breakout room. And then you're all going to tell your shared story one at a time. So I'll ask someone to tell us who the characters were. I'll ask someone else to say what happened, what was the event. I'll ask someone else to say what happened next. And I'll ask someone else to say what was the ending. And each time you'll hold up your pictures and tell the story. Okay, Manto, let's get on with this. Which breakout room is it going to be? It's going to be breakout room two. Fantastic. Who was in breakout room two? So we've got Chris and Dolores. So what we need to do is to spotlight those people in the room. Oh, it doesn't want to let me do that just now. One second. Oh, I should leave the chins on whilst we're doing this uh, bit of technical magicianship. Since we're waiting, it's a good opportunity to stretch. I'm sure lots of you have been, um, I'm sure lots of you have been doing a lot of sitting today. Well, let's see some stretching. Maybe some dancing to this uh, gentle lift music. Oh, looks like we're not spotlighting, so we might have to improvise. Yes, yeah, just one more second. Okay. Yeah, it's not wanting me to do all of them. So which room was it? It was two. I'm missing Dolores and Tara, but it doesn't let me spotlight them, unfortunately. Okay, let's see. Right, I am going to... Oh, so it says that Chris is spotlight. That's interesting. Never mind. Uh, so what we'll have to do is uh, go with speaker view and let's see. Ah, oh, look, here we go. Um, I think in our screens we might see... Like, I, I see us three spotlighted, actually. So if you're, not, so if you're not seeing the spotlight, you need to go to speaker view, everyone. So... Chris, I'm going to ask you to start. Can you hold up your picture of the character and tell us who it is? Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if you can see just, just this part. Oh, it looks rather familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty so beard. Is, uh, yeah, so this is someone named Andy who's trying to uh, prepare a talk for a conference. <laughs> Fantastic. And Tom, next... show us what happened. What was the event? What happened next? I think you just might have to turn off the background, boy. Okay. Just a minute. See, suspense is a big the part suspense of suspense. Suspense is killing me. Yeah. It's, it's what it's all about. You know, you need to create this sense of something needs to happen next. So this is, you know, obviously designed to be just like this. Thank you very much, Tom, for unblurring he, your background. So he was thinking about what to. Uh, what to do, and then he got uh, an invitation by Lean Global. Superb, and this is feels like a real life story. So, Luis, do tell, do show. What did Andy do? So Andy, I mean, let me unblur my background as well. Uh, I'm really impressed with you guys for all the unblurring. Yeah, if you try background. It's very good of you too, Brian. Thank okay. you. And uh, okay, cool. And so then Andy 
went to YouTube and uh, read a lot of books about different topics what, that he could present. And that is as far as the, uh, that's, uh, just to find inspiration for his talk. Fantastic. And then in the end, we're back around to you again, Chris. So what, what, how did it all end? You're muted, Chris. Sorry about that. So then he had his eureka moment when he realized that um, he does a lot of drawing. And so uh, there you go. He decided to do a talk on exactly that. Fantastic. Um, I'm new to everyone. Massive round of applause for the, for the team there. What a great story. Thank you. Brilliant. And uh, we'll, um, we'll uh, say to you two guys just now, thank you so much. It's been absolutely, that's great. So we'll just, um, we're, we're kind of at time. So I'll just, uh, I'll just finish off with the last bit. So we'll flip cameras again. And you know, what's interesting about that, even though it was a super simple story, it kind of felt like a story. It had, it had a flow to it that makes sense. So you can use that structure in a very simple way, but when do you use it? Well, that's kind of the last, the last question really, which is when do we use visual storytelling? And there's, there's really four, four very obvious and simple places to do that. The first is in the beginning. And in the beginning, we're really asking the question, how did we get here? And that's a way, a great way of people connecting to what's driving whatever they're going to do next. Uh, this is very often missed in any kind of change work. People just come in with a new thing that they're going to do without really acknowledging what's gone before. And that's a real opportunity missed. The next one is, well, where are we in the story? So what's actually going on? You know, so are we the uh, teenager frustrated on the planet of Tatooine? Or are we, you know, facing down the emperor? Or are we in fact, are we the emperor? Yeah. So where are we in the story? It locates us where we are, gives us a sense of really what do we need to do to move the needle. Um, and then, so this is, this is the middles. Um, and then there's the endings. So really the endings are all about, well, what happened? And actually connecting to what happened. And so um, there's one more though, which is the afters, which is long after, but it's really all about explaining and exploring the journey. What was the journey and why do we care? What happened and what does it mean to us? Um, and these are all compelling ways to really connect to why we are doing something and what matters. And of course, that might lead us on into another story. So I would just really encourage you, in closing, I'd really encourage you to play with using pictures to create shared memories that place you in some kind of narrative, some kind of story and see what that does for your teams and the companies that you're working with. For us at Work Visible, it's had a massive impact and it's also a lot of fun as a, as a happy side effect. So thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. If you are interested in more visual thinking stuff, just get in touch with us, uh, in touch with me on LinkedIn. There's a, there's a bunch of free things I can point you at um, if that's useful. And um, have a great rest of day and rest of conference. <laughs>